doom, fear, dread, and anxiety exist within the plush palaces, mansions, and estates of the wealthy and super rich because of ancient prophecies. You may not believe in them, but they surely do. Rome versus Persia, the end of a empire. Rome versus Persia, or Western civilization against Eastern civilization. Is this the planning of elite societies that has been anticipated and hoped for since the days of Alexander of Macedonia, who conquered the Persian Empire? At that time, Alexander failed to initiate the real plans behind the war between the Greeks and the Persians, which was a clash of civilizations to bring about a new world global order. The year. 2024, can the modern day elites complete this age old plan beginning at the Tower of Babel to complete global conquest by bringing about a clash of civilization to unite the Eastern and Western civilizations into one? global civilization zero hedge US to launch multi-day strikes against Iranian targets across Syria and Iraq the Biden administration is planning to launch a days long or even potentially weeks long attacking campaign on Iranian assets across the Middle East. Although there doesn't appear to be plans to hit Iran directly, according to U.S. officials speaking to NBC and CBS, the attacks which will reportedly focus on Iranian targets inside Syrian and Iraq are meant as retaliation and a supposed deterrent in response to the weakened drone attack which mortally harmed three American soldiers at a Jordanian base near the Syrian border. The attacks might extend to the Iranian Navy as well, in addition to targeting Iranian personnel or Iran-backed armies in Syria and Iraq. Iran has been reassured that they are not the target. Fear and respect seems to dictate the war plans of the Western powers. Why? Western civilization has dominated global affairs for centuries. The West has never feared to tread down foreign lands, sea, or skies. So why is there a sense of caution in the planning and the war cabinets of the West? Is it because an ancient prophecy? 
Let us investigate this ancient prophecy. One thing we can share about this ominous prophecy is that it predicted a war between Rome and Persia would destroy an empire and be the birth of a new world order. January 19th, 2024, World News. We are attacking Iran. Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of the State of Israel. But why? What could be gained by the initiation of a third world war? Yakut Shimoni, it's Hebrew. The English interpretation would be the gathering of Simeon and it's a 2,000 year old prophecy within the book Yakut Shimoni predicting the last war to be fought by mankind and in, in that prediction Western civilization, Rome, would be pitted against Eastern civilization with Iran, Persia playing a major role in that battle, the last war of mankind. The occult shimoni is biblical commentary or Tanakh commentary, also known as the Old Testament. And within this commentary is the prediction of the last war fought by mankind and its outcome, a new world order. When we are trying to understand the consternation and fear among global officials, including global elite and military officials worldwide, we will look into the records of Christian historians and biblical commentary as well as Islamic and Jewish records to understand this great war that was predicted thousands of years ago. Mediodia is a website that carries a conversation or discussion about the biblical commentary known as Yakut Shimoni or the gathering of Simeon. Within this discussion of the commentary, of the biblical commentary, there's a discussion on this upcoming war or the prediction of this up and coming war. Persia will completely annihilate Edom, which will cause Moshiach to come. Persia is interpreted as Iran. Edom is interpreted as Western civilization. And Moshiach 
is interpreted as Messiah or the word Christ. So if we read that sentence again, this is how it would sound in contemporary times. Iran will completely annihilate Western civilization, which will cause the Messiah or Christ to come. There's a verse in the Bible, King James Version, 2nd Esdras, chapter 6, verse 9, that gives some verification on the interpretation and explanation that is given in the book of Lakut Shimoni. For Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. This prophecy asserts that Esau, the brother of Jacob, also known as Edom, would be the last kingdom to rule the world and would be replaced by Jacob, also known as Israel, in the last days. And so, the downfall of Edom kingdom will be the beginning and a birth of a new world order or a new age. In this image, we have an artist's reconstruction of an ancient synagogue in Dera Europis, Syria. The Dera Europis Synagogue was destroyed in 256 AD by the successors of the Persian Empire, the Parthian Empire, that was also situated in the country of Iran. This synagogue contained many colorful frescoes drawn by the hand of the Jews themselves. This synagogue paintings were inspired by the works of Philo a Jew of Alexandria, Egypt. This synagogue contained images of biblical history of the Israelites, but symbolically, it also conveyed images of that time, and what the Jews were facing in that period in history, and symbolically, also future events that contained the hopes and aspirations of the Jews, of the Israelites, obtaining a kingdom, being saved by the Messiah and the 12 tribes in all Israel, being restored to their land in a new age of peace and prosperity in the future. The frescoes or paintings contain themes of end of days or last day themes, where in this dual image of Moses and Aaron leading the Israelites out of Egypt on the left and on the right the Persian king and his bride the Israelite woman Esther the synagogue characters are usually dressed either in Roman 
clothing or Persian clothing, representing Western civilization versus Eastern civilization. Because there was a common theme amongst the Israelites and the Gentile nations that the war between Rome and Persia, including Gog and Magog, would be the last war that mankind will fight. And then out of, out of that war, a new kingdom and civilization, a world civilization, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of righteousness would arise. In the Roman captivity, the Israelites were subjected to Roman laws, traditions, and customs. So in Rome, Israelites dressed as Romans, spoke Latin. In the Persian captivity, the Israelites was under the subjection of Persians, laws, customs, and traditions. The book of Esther takes place in the historical period of the Persian or Iranian captivity of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. The main characters of that history are Mordecai on the horse, a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin, an Israelite, and Haman, a descendant of Edomites who colonized Macedonia, a land in the northern part of Greece, and Assyrus, the Persian king, and his bride, last but not least, Esther, the tribe of Benjamin, an Israelite woman. So, we have in this image, Mordecai on the horse, an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, and on foot, Haman, a Macedonian, a Greek, an Edomite from the tribe of Amalek. The story of the book of Esther included this subplot of Haman working as a Greek Macedonian spy tries to overthrow the Persian government from the inside. But the plot and scheme is revealed by Mordecai who reveals this plan to the Persian king thus saving the Persian government from subversion from the inside. In this image, we have Esther, and this is her Persian name, like in this country, the United States, we have English names, we have Spanish names. Esther was her Persian name. Her Hebrew name was Hadessa. She also was an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, and this man seated on a throne is the Persian king Ahasuerus who many scholars believe was Xerxes the first of the Achaemenid Empire also known as the Persian Empire of Iran the children of Noah's sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth decided to establish a union of one people and to build a tower and a city. Their plans were rejected. Their tower 
destroyed. The nations were scattered into their own countries, contained by their own borders. But soon afterwards, nations arose and crossed their borders and sought to establish empires. And they entered their neighbor's lands and sought to eliminate borders and establish empires and a universal global civilization. Many wars were fought and none were able to succeed in a universal world empire. In the days of the Persian Empire, they too sought for world government, but the Greeks rose up against them under the leadership of Alexander of Macedonia. But the Greeks, under the leadership of Alexander, just didn't seek to protect their lands from the incursions of the Persians. They too, the Greeks, also sought universal world empire. Alexander was guided by his teacher, the philosopher Aristotle, who studied the previous plans of the past empires on how to establish this world empire. The plan was to use the idea of East versus West dichotomy. Out of this conflict of two opposing empires, the Greeks versus the Persians, a merging of two civilizations would occur, birthing one universal empire. Alexander conquered the Persian Empire, and the plans seemed like it would succeed. But Alexander rejected Aristotle's plan and tried to establish the plan of Plato, the teacher of Aristotle. This caused the premature death of Alexander by the agents of Aristotle, his teacher, in the year 323 BC. In time, the Greek Empire also fell by the hands of the Roman Empire. And the Romans also sought to establish what the previous empires couldn't, the world universal government. The Persian Empire in its day was considered the greatest empire by landmass in what is known as the inhabited world of that time which included Europe, Asia, and Africa. The territories outside this region was known as the uninhabited world, the Americas. The ancient geographers knew of the Americas because of the Phoenicians and Carthaginians, but it was labeled by the Greeks and the Romans the Americas were, the uninhabited world. The official policy of the Persian government, as was the governments before them, their predecessors, was to establish the world universal government. In the Persian Empire, and the Syrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire stood a superclass, an elite who recognized themselves above boundaries, a priest class, 
And so this priest class or philosopher class or scientific philosopher class saw the clash of civilizations as potentially beneficial for their interest. And that is because no matter where the boundaries lie, rather in Persia or in Greece, they would be the ruling class, even if unofficially so. So mythologies were concocted to cause tension between Greece and Persia. Herodotus, who is called the father of Greek history, in his book, he, the propaganda of the day, he tried to elaborate on the causes of the tension and war between the Persians and Greeks. And it was the cause related by mythology, such as when Zeus kidnapped Europa. Europa was a Persian or Phoenician princess, but the Persians considered the Phoenicians to be part of their empire. So it was considered an offense to the Persian empire for the kidnapping of Europa by Zeus or by the Greeks. That and many other such mythologies built up the tension between Greece and Persia. So in time, the Persians decided to invade Greece and absorb and consolidate them in their universal empire or their try, their attempt at universal global empire. And so the battle lines were drawn and Greek Western civilization was put against Persian and Eastern civilization. Alexander of Macedonia versus Darius III of Persia. But both Alexander and Darius were puppets in the hands of a group of priests, philosophers, such as Aristotle, Plato, and the Magi among the Persians. They were pawns in a larger game. Greek, representing Western civilization versus or against the Persian representing Eastern civilization under the leadership of Darius III of Persia while the Greeks were under the leadership of Alexander of Macedonia. And of course, the Greeks conquered the Persian Empire. The clash of civilizations East versus West to establish one global civilization, Alexander of Macedonia against Darius of Persia. And of course, Alexander played the game to the best of his ability and followed the instructions of the priest philosophers, the scientific elite, and conquered Persia and tried to make the Persian upper class and the Greek upper class merge into one people. As in the time of the Tower of Babel, And Alexander of Macedonia practiced what he preached and tried to set the example by 
marrying a Persian princess. Showing the world that nationalities and boundaries could be destroyed. And a new people could emerge from this scenario or plan. But in the end, Alexander was a fool because a child of this union doesn't produce a new group or a new race of people because the child is of the seed of his father. So the child that would be produced by Alexander and Roxanne will still be a Macedonian Greek. But Alexander was also considered a fool to his teacher, Aristotle, when Alexander failed to follow instructions that Aristotle had given him. What Aristotle would later find out that even though Alexander was a student of Aristotle. Alexander of Macedonia favored the works of Aristotle's teacher, Plato, and wished to build his empire or universal world government on Plato's republic. And so Aristotle considered Alexander a failed student, his worst pupil. But was Alexander really a fool? When even to this day, the world global elite base their blueprint of universal global religion and civilization on Plato's Republic. And Plato based his republic on the legend and mythology of Atlantis, which was the world or the antediluvian world or the world before the flood of Noah. So the legend of Atlantis or the world before the flood was considered a golden age in the time of Plato and the Magi's or priests, philosopher kings of Persia, the Magi. Now, the world in their days was full of war and strife. So they sought to rebuild a civilization a utopia based on a golden age and the global elite to this day are following this plan so the price that Alexander paid from straying off the course that Aristotle gave him was according to many historians a poison cup so, Alexander died young in the city of Babylon. His plans for universal world government incomplete. Universal Center for Renovation presents Historical Israelites. This video is strictly for educational purposes and Commentary Commentary of Biblical and Secular Historical Literature So enjoy He who owns Palestine, Israel, rules the world Part 6 R.T. News, 
January 19th, 2024. We are attacking Iran, Netanyahu. We are attacking Iran, Netanyahu. Israel Prime Minister accuses Tehran of supporting militant groups from the Houthis to Hezbollah to Hamas. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that Israel is already carrying out direct attacks on Iran and is making every possible effort to prevent Tehran from attaining fire weapons. Answering a reporter's question in Tel Aviv on Thursday about why Israel is conducting attacks on Iran's proxies rather than attacking the country directly, Netanyahu replied, Who says we are not attacking Iran? We are attacking Iran. On this global map, we can see or identify where the country, the modern country of Iran, ancient Persia, is. The country highlighted in green is where Iran, ancient Persia, is located globally. And this is a smaller scale map of Iran, ancient Persia. And on the top of Iran, you can see where the capital is located, Tehran. And the neighbors are Turkey, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan. These are the neighbors of Iran. And it's located right on the Persian Gulf. And to bring some gravitas or seriousness to this subject matter, because when it comes to biblical history, most people don't understand the level and accuracy of the Bible, which means books, collection of books from the Hebrews, which contains their laws, their history, their prophecies. The history of Iran or the ancient Persian people, the origin, the origin of the Persians are contained within the pages of the Bible. In the book of Genesis, chapter 10, let's see how this history from the archives of Iran and the history of the Western scholars match up with the ancient records of the Hebrews. Iran, also known as Persia, and officially the Islamic Republic of Iran, is a country in West Asia. It is bordered by Iraq to the west and Turkey to the northwest. Azerbaijan, Armenia, the Caspian Sea, and Turkmenistan to the north, Afghanistan to the east, Pakistan to the southeast, the Gulf of Oman and the Persian Gulf to the south. It is the world's 17th largest country. Iran has around 90 million people, making it the world's 17th most populous country. Its capital and largest city is Tehran, with around 16 million in its metropolitan area. Iran is home to one of the world's oldest civilizations, beginning with the formation of the Elamite kingdoms in the 4th millennium BC. It was first unified by the Medes in the 7th century BC and reached 
its territorial height in the 6th century BC when Cyrus the Great founded the Achaemenid Empire. Alexander the Great conquered the empire in the 4th century BC. It was subsequently divided into several Hellenistic states. An Iranian rebellion established the Parthian Empire in the 3rd century BC. The Parthians destroyed the synagogue of Dera Europis, which was succeeded in the 3rd century AD by the Sassanian Empire. Arab Muslims conquered the empire in the 7th century AD, leading to its Islamization. Iran therefore became a major center of Islamic culture and learning. As of the year 2024, Iran is a country of Islamic education and learning, and their particular branch of Islam would be called the faction of Shiites. Zoroastrianism was a pre-Islamic religion of the ancient Persians or the ancient people of Iran. In this map, we can have a glimpse back in history of the ancient peoples or nations of ancient Iran. To the north where Tehran stands today was the people of Media, also known as the Medes. Within the circle, we can always look at the comparison between a face of a man of Elam and a face of a man of Persia. Elam and Persia were the same people living in different locations. Elam and Persia, according to biblical history and also secular history. This is an image of a royal Persian guard, protector of the king of Persia. These men were known historically as the immortals. The ancient Persians were the children of Shem, Noah's son Shem. They are the children of Elam. Elam was a son of Shem. The Persians are Shemites. The ancient Persians are Shemites. In this particular map, we can see and highlighted area. This is the land of the children of Elam. Elam was the son of Shem. Elam was the grandson of Noah. And this territory, this area in Iran, was where they settled after the flood. Elam, Elam, was an ancient civilization centered in the far west and southwest of modern-day Iran. Elamite states were among the leading political forces of the ancient Near East. In classical literature, Elam was also known as Susiana, its capital, Susa. Many Brazilian families carry this name, Susa. It has Hebrew origin, Susa, meaning a lily. And classical literature refers to ancient Greek literature. And a little bit more history, the complete works of Josephus by Flavius Josephus, an ancient Israelite of the tribe of Levi, the priest. And he writes thus, Shem, the third son of Noah, 
had five sons who inhabited the land that began at Euphrates River and reached to the Indian Ocean for Elam left behind him, the Elamites, the ancestors of the Persians. And this information is contained within the Old Testament, the Torah, the five books of Moses, and the Tanakh, Genesis 10 and 22, King James Version. The children of Shem, Elam. Elam was the firstborn of Shem. Shem was the son of Noah. The Elamites are Shemites from Shem. This research is supported by using the King James Version Bible 1611 or your preferred preference or version and the Torah scrolls and archaeology from various universities and research institutions worldwide and historical literature secular or biblical the bible is historically accurate it contains many subject matters including prophecy but it is historically accurate there's a book this is history and archaeology Elam and Persia by Javier Alvarez Mon and Mark B. Garrison concerning Elam and Persia. And we have a little bit of history here to show that the biblical chronicles are actual history. It's not mythology, but it's actual history. Our ancestors actually wrote their records on this clay type of substance and they baked these clay either tablets or cylinders or prisms and these records are almost indestructible so 2,000 years later a thousand years later when the archaeologists discover these records where their histories were actually written down they were able to understand what took place a thousand years ago two thousand years ago the records were preserved by the ingenuity of these ancient scholars so the Cyrus cylinder is a clay tablet on the bottom and on the right, Sennacherib prism preserve the records of that time. Sennacherib prism were the history records of the Hasyrians. Cyrus cylinder was the actual records of the Persians. And these records actually attest to the existence of Elam certain cities in Persia, ancient Persia, these were actual people. This is actual history. That's why these prophecies are so important because this stuff was serious. It's actually happened. The history actually happened. So they expect the prophecies to actually come to pass. The word elite tries their best at times to break the prophecies, to upset the prophecies, to make sure they don't come to pass and that their plans come to pass. But they always fail. So let's read a little of this. A note on the limits of Ansan, which was an ancient city region in Iran. In a recent study dedicated to Cyrus the Great, and his ancestry, 
Cyrus the Great is mentioned in the Bible as the Persian king who allowed Judah, Benjamin, and Levi to rebuild Jerusalem and leave the Babylonian captivity that they were experiencing after 70 years. And the author continues, I or he focused very literally on the much discussed testimony of the Cyrus cylinder. And that cylinder is on the bottom. According to which Cyrus and his forebearers were kings of Ansan. As this paragraph goes on, it also includes the Nabonidus Chronicle or Babylonian Chronicles, which employs the same title. And on the Sennacherib Prism inscriptions that also mentions Cyrus and his relation to the city of Anslan. And to end this off, it mentions that Cyrus, or this paragraph mentions that Cyrus and his forebears were in fact kings of Ansan, an Ansan that still existed in the 6th century BC. A Wikipedia article, Anshan, will give some context to this history. Anshan was an Elamite, an ancient Persian city. It was one of the earliest urban states to exist because the grandson of Noah, Elam, his people settled in this area after the flood. It's one of the capitals of Elam and one of the earliest capitals of Elam, Anshan. One of the early capitals of Persia. Within this, this red circle is the region of Elam. And right in the middle is Anshan, the ancient capital of Elam. Location of Anshan within the Elamite Empire. And also, as a side note, this map also shows the approximate Bronze Age extension of the Persian Gulf is shown in this image. In the days of Abraham, Ur, the city that Abraham left to immigrate or migrate into the land of Canaan, that city was a port city. Ur of the Chaldeans was a port city. So, the Chaldeans who lived in the port city of Ur were able to sail to the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, the east coast of Africa, to India, and Malaysia, because their city lied directly on the Persian Gulf in those days. Today, that area and region in Iraq is landlocked. But in those days, it lied right on the shores of the Persian Gulf. And some scholars have found evidence to show that the Chaldeans actually sailed to the Americas for resources that they needed and used in those days. But getting back on track with the history of Iran and the Persian Empire, Collins Atlas of the Bible, the land, events, and people of the world's most famous book that is the Bible on the left there's a map of the divisions 
that the Persians allotted to the lands that they conquered. I'm paying special attention to the area and region of Judea and Jerusalem. This region was called and named Abar Nahara, region number five, by the Persians. And on this map, if we are to take a look all the way to the bottom, to the left, is the city of Jerusalem. In front of the arrow are Kadarites, or the children of Kadar, Ishmaelites, or Arabs. Modern day scholars recognize this area as Eber Nari. Eber Nari, or as the Persians named this place, Abar Nahara, meaning beyond the river or across the river. But the area was actually named in honor of Eber, the ancestor of the Hebrews. And Eber means from the past. Beyond the river means, or across the river means, the Euphrates River. Because Abraham crossed the Euphrates River, Abraham and Lot. And that was the beginning of the ancient Hebrews living in the land of Canaan. Before that time, they were living on the other side of the Euphrates, the east side of the Euphrates. When they crossed the river, they lived on the west side of the Euphrates. And also, the name Eber carried symbolic meaning, meaning from the past or beyond the river or across the river, which meant this language, Eber, Hebrew, it's not beyond the river, it's before the flood, the language before the flood. So this area and this name, Eber Nari, was from a Persian viewpoint, and this area was a region of Western Asia and a satrapy, which means it was ruled by a governor of the Persians, so it was considered subjected to the Persian Empire and not an independent kingdom, but part of the Persian state, particularly the Achaemenid Empire from 539 to 332 BC. Also, this area was in the jurisdiction of at Hura, and this is important to understand how the Greeks and the Romans, why they view the Hebrews as Assyrians and Syrians. At Hura, the jurisdiction or area of At Hura, Abar Nahara. Region number five was named after Eber, Eber, an ancestor of the Ishmaelites or the Arabs and the Israelites, according to the table of nations in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 10 to 11, in the books of Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 1. The lineage, Eber was a great grandson of Noah's son, Shem. These are actually real men, real people, who names was memorialized because their children named their lands after their forefathers. This region or 
the land of Judea or that area where the Jews lived was called by the Persians of that time Assyria so when you look up the article Achaemenid Assyria this is the reason at the Hura this region was also called Assyria because when the Persians conquered that territory from the Babylonians they saw all these people who were Assyrians that area was part of the Assyrian Empire the northern tribes of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians resettled that area with Babylonians and Assyrians so when the Persians entered that area they saw Jews they saw Assyrians they saw Babylonians so they consider that region oh this is where Assyrians live so it was a province of Assyria and the Greeks shortened the term from Assyria to Syria also called Assyria was a geographical area within the Achaemenid or Persian Empire from 539 to 330 BC it was a military protectorate state and a satrapy this area had to be ruled by a Persian military governor because it was in a constant state of rebellion they were constantly trying to break off from the Persian Empire continue with the article it mostly incorporated the territories of the Neo-Assyrian Empire the Persians took over Neo-Assyrian territory this area today is in modern-day northeastern Syria also called Eber Nari the Neo-Assyrian Empire collapsed because of a coalition or an invasion by a coalition of some of its former subject peoples the Iranian peoples also known as the Medes and the Persians so this province was called by the Persians Assyria but the Greeks shortened that term from Assyria into the term Syria Greek classical literature is the work of Israelites they didn't call themselves Israelites they called themselves Greeks Phoenicians Syrians but Homer he was an Israelite Aristotle Plato they were Israelites maybe this can help you understand this problem of misnaming the Israelites in ancient history what did Herodotus call Jewish people or Jews that is the question that's being asked what did Herodotus call Jewish people Hebrews under Persian rule the Hebrews were under Persian rule from 536 BC to 332 BC Emperor Cyrus the Great granted the Hebrews the right to return to Jerusalem from exile and established the Hebrews second common oath answer and explanation Herodotus did not spend much time writing about the Jewish people that's not completely true the ancient Greeks had long traded with the Hebrews in Jerusalem but beyond trade there was not much interaction 
that's not completely true because when the northern tribes of Israel was pushed out of their lands, the Assyrians who pushed the Israelites, the northern tribes out of their land, replaced those or refilled those cities with Assyrian colonists. That caused many Israelites who were of the southern tribes of Israel, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, to migrate westward into Cyprus, Crete, Greece, Italy, and Spain. Judah, Benjamin, and Levi also migrated into other areas such as Turkey or Asia Minor. In the New Testament, the apostles, like Paul, went into those areas to reach those Israelites that migrated into those areas in the time of the Assyrians and before that time. Herodotus' own understanding was very limited and as a result, in the histories, he misnamed the Hebrews by writing the Syrians of Palestine when describing them. So when we read Greek classical literature, Israelites or Jews would be called Syrians, Phoenicians, Carthaginians, and other such names. According to Herodotus, the culture and practices of the Syrians, it should be Israelites of Palestine, but in Greek literature, they're called Syrians. The Syrians of Palestine came from Egypt during the Exodus and were a people who practiced circumcision. Part of his confusion may have stemmed from the fact that the Jews were under Persian rule at this time. Historians also believe Herodotus never made it as far as Jerusalem, only reaching Babylon and Susa, the capital city of Persia, in the east. It is even possible that Herodotus may have actually been describing the Philistines instead of the Hebrews. No, he was describing the Israelites, the Jews, who were called Syrians of Palestine, the Syrians. The timeline of the name Palestine, because the Israelites were called the Syrians of Palestine. This article presents a list of notable historical references to the name Palestine as a place name for the region of Palestine and the wider Middle East and West Asia throughout the history, included its counterparts in other languages, such as Arabic, Philistine, and Latin, Palestinia. The term Palisette, transliterated from hieroglyphics as P-R-S-T, in this Egyptian ancient language, vowels were removed. It's found in five inscriptions referring to a neighboring people who are generally identified with the Philistines or their land, Philista, starting from circa 1150 BCE during the 20th dynasty of Egypt. Palestine was named after the people who lived there, Philistines. The Philistines were Hamites, they were Egyptians in origin. And this is a continuation of the article timeline of the name Palestine. The term Palestine first appeared in the 5th century BCE when the ancient Greek historian Herodotus wrote of a district of Syria called Palestine between Phoenicia and Egypt in the histories or the book called Herodotus the histories Herodotus provide the first historical reference 
clearly denoting a wider region than biblical Philistia. As he applied the term to both the coastal, the area where the Philistines actually lived on the coast, and the inland regions such as the Judean mountains. So included in Herodotus term Palestine, he included Judea or the areas where the Jews lived. So they was also called Palestinians or Philistines. This is what Herodotus called the Jews, Syrians of Palestine. In the Jordan Rift Valley. So that term Palestine, because of Herodotus, that term was expanded from just a coastal area to also include lands where the Jews lived, the Judean mountains. That's Jerusalem. Tatidus, the first century Roman historian, also confirms Jews were misnamed by foreign historians. Modern Jewish history, Tacitus on the Jews. And this is concerning the origin of the Jews and who they were. Some say that the Jews were fugitives from the island of Crete. Jews lived on the island of Crete. Who settled on the nearest coast of Africa. Jews or Israelites also lived in North Africa. When the Assyrians pushed out the northern tribes, Jews scattered everywhere. They migrated into different areas around the Mediterranean. About the time when Saturn was driven from his throne by the power of Jupiter, Tacitus is a Roman pagan historian. There's a mountain in Crete. There's a famous mountain in Crete called Ida. Israelites were living in Crete. But let's skip to the highlighted part. Many again say that they were a race of Ethiopian origin. This clearly gives you the physical features of the Jews in the first century. Many Romans considered the Jews an Ethiopian race, or Ethiopian means burnt skin. Okay, let's continue. Who in the time of King Cepheus, who was the king of Ethiopia, but this Ethiopia was not located in the Sudan. It was located in the land of Israel, and the city was Joppa, a city near Tel Aviv today. And, 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 and who in the time of King Cepheus were driven by fear and hatred of their neighbors to seek a new dwelling place? This is the point I want to make. Others describe them as an, an Syrian horde. They was described also as Assyrians because this is the name Assyria that the Persians called this region or called the area of Palestine, where the Jews live, Assyrians. Also, the Greeks shortened that term to Syrians. In the Greek history, Herodotus mentions that Perseus was an Assyrian in origin, not an actual Assyrian. In their mythology, Perseus was an Israelite. The place where this history took place was on the coast of Israel in the city of Joppa. These histories and mythologies were written by Israelites about Israelites, falling under the names such as Greeks, Phoenicians, and so on. So let's get back to the main reason this video was made. Rome versus Persia, or the Western civilization versus the Eastern civilization. And this conclusion would be the end 
of a empire. What empire? What empire will come to an end when these two civilizations, Rome representing Western civilization versus Persia, meaning Eastern civilization, including Iran, Russia, and China, and other affiliated nations. This war, Western civilization versus Eastern civilization, has been taking place for the last 2,000 years, at least. This is why, in the Roman captivity, the Jews dressed as Romans, and in the Persian captivity, or Iran captivity, the Israelites dressed in Persian clothing. And the Israelites imagined the clash of these two powerful empires, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, including Russia and China, would cause the birth of a new civilization. And so, in the year 2024, the target is Iran to initiate the final war in the clash of civilizations. And the elite tremble. Some fear this. And some want this war to happen. But this will change everything. So fear and dread is in plush palaces, mansions, and estates of the global elite and the super wealthy. And they are building bunkers and trying to protect themselves from the final outcome of this long awaited and anticipated war. And this news article is from The Telegraph. Iran is now a legitimate target for Israeli missile strikes, senior minister says. Nur Bakat tells the Telegraph that Israel can afford to keep fighting and as big as the crisis is, it is also a really big opportunity. Mr. Bakat who is favorite to succeed Benjamin Netanyahu as leader of the ruling Likud party said Israel could afford to keep fighting and open up a new front with Lebanon despite the billion shekel a day cost of the conflict. He said that as big as the crisis is, it is also a really big opportunity with governments around the world needing Israel technical expertise to combat global issues. The head of the snake is Tehran, the capital of Iran. The risk of the war spreading to Lebanon and as far as Iran will alarm Western leaders, Western civilization leaders, with Mr. Barkat becoming increasingly influential in the ruling party, the state of Israel. Polls suggest the economy minister would win five more seats than Mr. Netanyahu if he replaced him as Likud's leader. It doesn't really matter if Benjamin Netanyahu wins or lose, or if Mr. Bakat wins or lose, or is the next prime minister. This Eastern-Western civilization conflict will still continue until it's reached its proper conclusion. 
as the country, the state of Israel, lurches to the right in the aftermath of October 7th, and with Mr. Netanyahu's personal ratings plummeting, Mr. Bakat appears to be making a play to replace the prime minister as party leader. Referencing the question board or website, Mayadia, which in Hebrew means, who knows? Persia will completely annihilate Edom which will cause Moshiach to come. Persia, Iran, so let's read this in the contemporary point of view. Iran will completely annihilate Western civilization, which will cause the Messiah to come or the Christ to come. This conversation took place eight years ago. I heard that in a passage in the Talmud, it says Persia will completely annihilate Edom and the rest of the world which will then spur about Moshiach or the Messiah's arrival. And this was in the Yakut Shemoni. This commentary by scribes and scholars commenting on biblical passages of the end of days. It records the following amazing but scary prophecy regarding the events that will unfold just prior to the messianic era. Rabbi Yishak or Rabbi Isaac said the year in which the King Messiah reveals himself to all of mankind, all of the nations of the world will be fighting with each other. The King of Paris or Persia Iran will fight with the king of Arabia and the king of Arabia will go to Amram, Syria. The translation actually reads Edom, but I'm going to explain that later. To seek counsel from them, the king of Paris will attempt to destroy the entire world and all the nations of the world will be screaming and confused and falling on their faces. And they will experience pains like those of a woman giving birth. The Jewish people will also be screaming and confused and will say, To where shall we come and go? To where shall we come and go? And God will say to them, My children, don't be afraid for all that I have done. I only did this for your sake. Why are you afraid? The time for your redemption has come. So the person asks, my question is, what weapon of choice will Persia or Iran use to bring about this result? And this is from a comment from the book Yakut Shemoni or the Gathering of Simeon, which is biblical commentary on this verse. Persia will completely annihilate Edom, which will cause Moshiach or the Messiah to come. So many historians or scholars believe that this is a 2,000 year old prophecy of Lakut Shemani. So was this written by 1st century Jews, Israelites? Or is this 13th century rabbinic literature? Let's hear or read what Wikipedia has to say about this matter. Lakut Shimoni. The Lakut Shimoni, or simply Lakut, is an Agetic compilation on the books of the Hebrew Bible, or this is biblical commentary. It is a compilation of older interpretations and explanations of biblical passages. So, these rabbinical scholars put together this book that gave interpretations and explanations, biblical breakdowns of passages of the Bible 
and like Coop Shimoni was the end result of that book of their interpretation of scriptures. Most of the text has been translated into German, the German language, in 16 volumes as of 2023 by Dagmar Borner Klein. So this is interpretations of the ancient exegetes or biblical commentaries and explanations for certain or passages or verses of the Bible, the Torah, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Author and date. The author cannot be determined with certainty. The title page of the Venice or the City of Venice edition ascribes the composition of the work to a rabbi, Simeon of Frankfurt, the chief of the exegesis. And this was accepted by David Conforti, who called him Simeon Ashkenazi of Frankfurt and maintained by Rabbi Simeon in the 11th century. But this assertion is untenable since the Kul Shemanui included Mizrashim of a later date, or it contained explanations and interpretations from a time before the 11th century. So the book wasn't completed in the 11th century. So they know it's not a work of the 11th century. It contained material from a later date. The author of Le Coup Chamonix flourished in the early part of the 13th century. According to Zunz, the work was written by Rabbi Simeon Kara, who lived in southern Germany. It is certain that a manuscript of Le Coup Chamonix, mentioned by Azariah de Rossi, existed in 1310. But despite this, there is scarcely any allusion to the work during the 14th and 15th century. This may be ascribed, however, to the unhappy position of the German Jews and to the repeated persecutions of the period. For peace and prosperity was necessary for the copying of so extensive a work, and the Jews of Germany had neither. After the beginning of the 15th century, on the other hand, the work must have been disseminated in foreign countries, for it was used by Spanish scholars of the later half of that century. Isaac Abravanel being the first to mention this book. So this book was basically written by scholars, some ancient, some medieval. And this was their interpretation and explanation on how the end times will unfold globally between warring powers or warring nations. And in that time, the Messiah would arrive. Let's look a little bit more into this. It doesn't really matter if I or you believe their particular interpretations of how this scenario unfolds. Western versus Eastern civilization collapsing, clash to bring about a birth of a new world order. There's Christian versions of this idea and Islamic versions of this idea. So we're going to try to bring all these ideas into this discussion and compare it to what's happening today. The 2000 year old prophecy in La Shimoni with recent nerve wracking events involving Iran and their quest for fire weapons. Sharat Devora reposts a post from Jewfax about a 2000 year old prophecy the post reads in part, a piece of rabbinic literature written 2,000 years ago, known as the Lakot Shemoni, touches on many future scenarios. 
both for the nation of Israel and for the world. In its section on the biblical book of Isaiah and the prophecies contained therein, a rabbi cited by the Lakut Shemoni states that the year the Messiah will arrive when all the nations of the world will antagonize each other and threaten with war, the king of Persia, Iran, antagonizes the king of Arabia, Saudi Arabia, with war. The king of Arabia goes to Edom, the western countries, headed by the United States of America, for advice. Then the king of Persia destroys the world. And since that cannot be done with conventional weapons, it must mean fire weapons, which can destroy most of the world. And all the nations of the world begin to panic and are afraid. And Israel too is afraid as to how to defend from this. God then says to them, Do not fear, for everything that I have done is for your benefit to destroy the evil kingdom of Edom and eradicate evil from this world so that the Messiah can come. Your time of redemption is now. Pasha Blotswat. So, biblical scholars considered Edom and Western culture in general to be the same entity or the same group. Let's delve into this from my Yodia or who knows. Edom is considered by the rabbis to be the Roman Empire. And while contemporary Western culture isn't Roman per se, it is directly descended from Roman culture and ideas. So rabbis identify Edom as the founders of the Roman Empire. Rather, the comparison of Rome to Edom are literal or metaphorical. Some historians consider Rome and Edom literal. Like, the Romans are the literal descendants of Edom. There was a population replacement from the land of Edom into Europe. So, the last uh, conversation was about, or what the rabbinical scholars were saying was Edom and Western civilization, including USA, was the same entity. So, we're going to try to find out why do the rabbinical scholars, or why do scholars in general consider that? My Yodia, who knows? Why is Edom considered to be Western culture and not Southern Jordan? Southern Jordan being where the original homeland of the ancient Edomites existed. I have a vague notion of hearing in various places that America or Western culture or Western civilization in general is Edom. And that this final exile is called Gallus Edom or Galu Edom. Uh, also, as in reference to the blessing in Genesis 27, when one is in power, Esau, when Esau is in power, the other, Jacob, isn't. Anyway, is Western culture considered Edom? If so, why them? When Europeans existed during the time of the kingdom of Edom, when Japhet existed in Europe during the time of the kingdom of Edom, and Nahu ever still lives in southern Jordan where the kingdom of Edom actually was. This person is completely confused. They're saying or making a statement there was Europeans in ancient time in Europe. At the same time the kingdom of Edom existed in southern Jordan. Are they not the same people? But the scholars are trying to say the people in Europe and the people of Southern Edom are not the same. And that there was some type of population replacement of the people that live in Europe in ancient times with the people that lived in Southern Jordan called Edom. And that the people that lived in Southern Jordan now live in Europe. 
Jewish Virtual Library, Edom, Ancient Jewish History, Transjordan, Palestine. Edom was a land in the southeastern Transjordan, the southeastern neighbor of Palestine. Edom, the country, the land of Edom, is the most common name for the Edomite territory. It had, however, other names and appellations, both prosaic and poetic. The field of Edom, Seir, Mount Seir, the land of Seir, and also the lands of Seirs. Edom, the kingdom of Edom, existed from the 13th century BC to 55 3 BC in the southern part of the region of Palestine. The kingdom of Edom ceased to exist when the Babylonian Empire destroyed the kingdom. Edom ceased to be an independent kingdom and the Edomites were scattered to different parts of the world. And like their brother Jacob of Is or Israel, the Edomites still had colonies in the land of Edom proper, known as Idumia. They had colonies in different parts of the world, in Europe, in Armenia, in Phoenicia, and parts of Europe, and other parts of the Middle East. They were scattered, but they still had colonies that existed in different parts of the world. Ancient prophecies. Israelite scholars and secular scholars believe that Esau had a major role to play in the end times, as in the book, Second Edris, six, chapter 6, verse 9, King James Version. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is is the beginning of it that followeth. So Esau had a major role to play as Western civilization and end time scenarios. Western culture, Western culture, also known as Western civilization, European civilization, Western society, is an umbrella term which refers to the diverse heritages of social norms, ethical values, traditional customs, belief systems, political systems, artifacts, and technologies of the Western world. Western civilization, broadly defined, finds its roots in the foundations laid by Greco-Roman civilization and the tenets of Western Christianity. It has also been substantially influenced by societal influences from Germanic peoples. Whilst Western culture is a broad concept and does not relate to a region with fixed members or geographical confines, it may relate to the cultures of countries with historical ties to a European country or a number of European countries or the variety of cultures of Europe itself. However, the countries towards the east of Europe are sometimes excluded from definitions of the Western world. Western countries, culture, civilization, Edom. The European Renaissance artist Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, based on the correlation of ideal human proportions with geometry described by the ancient Roman architect Vitruvius in book three of his treatise, The Architecture. There are links between Greco-Roman and modern Western civilization. This history isn't unknown among secular or biblical historians, the links between Roman civilization and modern European or Western civilization. This is mainstream 
information. The Hidden History of Western Civilization, The Dying God by David Livingston. So there's a hidden history of Western civilization. Modern European civilization does have links to ancient Greco-Roman civilization, but Greco-Roman civilization has links to the Near East, to the land of Palestine. Few would acknowledge that our knowledge of history could be significantly inaccurate. The most common conception of history is one that begins in Greece, the cradle of Western civilization then progress through Rome and finally Europe and America. However, this merely represents a strictly Western version of history and one that is often confused with the history of the world. Fortunately though, recent scholarship has begun to elucidate the extent of the indebtedness of Western history to other civilization, running our notion of Western civilization obsolete. Rather, a more accurate assessment of the past will reveal a neglected account, the hidden history of Western civilization, which began in Mesopotamia in the 6th century BC with the birth of a tradition centered around the myth of a dying God. The development of this tradition led to the emergence of philosophy among the Greeks, then influenced the formation of Christianity and was appropriated and elaborated upon by the Arabs during the Middle Ages. Ultimately, being introduced to Europe during the Crusades, it eventually spawned the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. European civilization and culture is based on ancient Middle Eastern cultures, pre-Christian cultures, pagan cultures, from the land of Canaan and from Mesopotamia or Babylon. Wikipedia, dying and rising deity. A dying and rising death, rebirth, or resurrection deity is a religious motif in which a god or a goddess dies and is resurrected. Examples of gods who die and later return to life are most often cited from the religions of the ancient Near East. The traditions influenced by them included the Greco-Roman mythology. The concept of a dying and rising God was first proposed in comparative mythology by James Fraser, seminal work, The Golden Bow, 1890. Fraser associated the motif with fertility rites surrounding the yearly cycle of vegetation. Frazier cited the examples of Osiris, Tammuz, Adonis, and Attis, Ziggurus, Dionysus, and Jesus. Frazier's interpretation of the category has been critically discussed in 20th century scholarship to the conclusion that, may, that many examples from the world's mythologies, including under dying and rising, should only be considered dying but not rising, and that the genuine dying and rising God is a characteristic feature of Near Eastern mythologies. In the derived mystery cults of late antiquity, death or departure of the gods is a motif. So, Western civilization had a religion and a culture that predates Christianity. And the major god of that civilization is Tanzmuz. It has been surmised that the Jesus of Western culture and civilization is not the Jesus of the New Testament, but a Near Eastern god named Tammuz, who was modeled off of an ancient Babylonian king called Nimrod. Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 14 Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house which were 
towards the north and behold there sat women weeping for Tammuz 